Okay, so good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to Friday morning, which is a, always a good place to be in the working week, Friday morning. And in particular, welcome to the Cornerstone Barristers Planning Week and the last day of the planning week today. So this morning, um, it will be me dealing with plan making in a changing climate. And then this afternoon, there is a further talk dealing with remote hearings and where are we now? So hopefully a useful end to what has certainly been a very uh, busy week. So um, first of all, confirmation in the photograph that this is me. Uh, unfortunately, Rob Williams is unable to join us this morning. But for those of you who have been doing your homework, you will have seen that he has provided a detailed and insightful paper on sustainability appraisals, uh, where we are at the moment taking stock and how we might move forward in light of the government's uh, fairly clear proposals to shift radically the approach to sustainability appraisal within the local planning process. Uh, you may also have seen, those of you who have been uh, very busy with the homework, my paper on duty to cooperate and some suggestions that I've made there that I'll follow up through today's talk and which will doubtless uh, be coming back as a number of these issues will over the coming weeks and months. So uh, just to recap uh, briefly on the Cornerstone Planning Week, for those of you who haven't had an opportunity to join us earlier in the week, you can see the various activities that have been going on there, um, covering a broad swathe of topical issues in planning law at the moment. And the first of those is now available online. The others will follow shortly in our uh, ever-increasing library of webinars, um, something that I will refer back to later because one of the uh, one of the important parts of the approach in this relatively new world is to try not to replicate what has been dealt with relatively recently in other webinars that have been dealing with similar subject matter. And so I will try as best I can uh, to adhere to that guidance. But the uh, ever-increasing library means that the Cornerstone channel is now becoming just a little bit like Netflix. Uh, you can come on and watch a number of episodes at one time if you wish to, a um, bit of binge watching perhaps on a, a Friday afternoon when all of the uh, work is done. But moving on to the topics for this morning, I'm going to be covering four uh, main issues. The first is going to really be the focus of today, and that's uh, the white paper what does it mean in terms of plan making? How much do we know at the moment about what it means in terms of plan making? Uh, looking, at, as I do from time to time, next at the duty to cooperate and asking, well, what next there in relation to a duty that has been so powerful in shaping the local plan process, but yet which the government has plainly indicated it doesn't see as fit for purpose and which, if, if these proposals are carried through, will be abolished. So what next in that respect? Uh, thirdly, to look at sustainability appraisal at, at a relatively high level, and again, just with a view to what might be coming down the tracks uh, in that respect. And then fourthly, and doing the best I can for today uh, here, flying solo, as it were, fielding questions that may come up through the Q&A tab that we uh, have enabled, but also uh, potentially following up on questions later by email. So if, in, if people have questions arising from the subject matter that's being discussed today, then please don't hesitate to get in touch and we will uh, revert to you next week with answers on points that may be raised. So uh, as I said, Cornerstone in terms of its uh, planning publications webinars has had a busy year. One part of that was the local plan webinar series, which is available on our web pages. And I've reproduced the links there just as a reminder of the main topics that were canvassed at that stage. So we did have a, a detailed look then at the SEA SA process um, together with joint planning across authority lines. Uh, we also had a look at what has been perhaps the single most vexed issue, certainly around the M25 um, bells of authorities of, of green belt release. And then also looking at issues which have been another uh, very sharp focus of the local planning process, the viability and funding infrastructure 
that is required in particular in relation to the uh, facilitation of garden communities, which has been be, become such an important plank of the government's approach to providing sufficient numbers of new homes going forward. So what's interesting to note about each of those four topics is that they get significant attention in the white paper, uh, mostly by way of change to what the existing position will be, with the clear exception of Greenbelt, where the government's present policy approach appears to be one that will continue into the foreseeable future. And it'll be very interesting to follow the detail of that as it emerges through the new legislation and guidance. But all of these four issues have also been specifically identified by the government within the white paper as well as more broadly of being issues that create very real uh, sometimes principal dif difficulties in the local plan process but also practical difficulties in assembling a sufficient evidence base that will satisfy the test of soundness uh, now in paragraph 35 of the 2019 MPPF. And so these issues will continue to be central issues as local plan making moves forward. And so going on to the white paper itself, one of the things that's slightly unusual about a, a legal discussion in this kind of context is because of the stage the proposals are presently at, um, we are dealing with things at a relatively high level of abstraction. And it's just an interesting feature of the approach the government has adopted that there was no green paper in relation to what these changes might be. They moved straight to the white paper stage. But in doing so, they have generated a document that is just about 50 pages in terms of the detailed text that's there. The consultation is now closed, as we know. It has been a controversial consultation. There are different measures about just how controversial, but on any view, it's been significantly controversial. Part of the reason behind that is the way that the uh, Prime Minister and other ministers have, have set out what these proposals are intended to achieve in the forward that we'll look at in just a moment. But in terms of what is going to be necessary to bring these reforms into play, there is going to be very significant changes to primary legislation. Following that, there will be much more detailed changes to the secondary legislation. And of course, one of the difficulties as far as lawyers are concerned over the last really decade or 15 years has been that quite often it's only really when the secondary legislation comes about that we start to see the real uh, flesh of the proposals taking form and then thirdly underneath the secondary legislation there will need to be a raft of new guidance dealing with these issues and if the government continues on its current approach to guidance, which is to make the guidance really as concise as it can be, then it's entirely possible that in the search for concision, that guidance will still leave open a very significant number of questions for later debate, although the government plainly has an eye on that, and they are trying to find a balance where they move to a rules-based system in a way that the local plan can be a definitive uh, plank of planning decision making going forward. So what that leads to in terms of the consultation is that there is an unavoidable lack of fine detail at this point because of the way the government has, has chosen to frame the consultation. And one of the interesting things just to remark upon is that a number of the consultation responses that have been provided are actually longer than the white paper itself in terms of the amount of text and the level of detail um, that has been gone into within those comments. It, it continues to provoke uh, controversy, the consultation. There's a letter today uh, written by various lumina luminaries in the FT, which describes the uh, approach in this way. And I'll just read it to, to get a flavour of one of the consultation responses, that the government's approach is driven by ill-defined proposals and misplaced enthusiasm for change, which seek to replace flexibility and nuance with rules, codes and zones. Uh, that would lose the inherent depth and subtlety of a system that allows challenge, locally derived solutions and democratic accountability while driving public benefit from private gain. And just thinking about the amount of the amount of concepts and material that, that is contained in, in that one quote, you start to see the level of ambition that the government 
is trying to take forward here. Uh, and that level of ambition is nowhere more clear than in the foreword to the white paper that the Prime Minister uh, signed. And we can see there people will be uh, familiar with these phrases, but the basic proposition is a whole new planning system for England. And, and one of the things that has come up really quite sharply in the consultation responses is whether there really is adequate justification for such a radical approach to changes to the planning system, uh, which uh, on the one hand might be characterised as a creaking house uh, ever more dilapidated over time. On the uh, other side might be categorised as a very well oiled, refined machine that has been improved in stages over an extended period of time. So it really depends on one's perspective as to the conclusion you might reach about that. And it's interesting that a number of the uh, prominent responses to the consultation indicate that really the government hasn't as yet made the case for such radical reform. And so even the, the, the in principle idea of whether or not a zoning system along the lines that the government has in mind is a significant improvement on the existing system is very much up for debate uh, within the consultation. So, in terms of the ambition, where that is seeking to carry the government is, is into the territory that it was already seeking by the existing system to achieve, and that is a continuing boost to the provision of housing on a nationwide basis. And there's a quite separate discussion that's going on at a level of detail that we simply can't canvas today about the appropriateness of using that national number and whether or not e even adoption of that national number and building at those kinds of levels will in fact do um, what the government uh, proposes ought to be happening, which is building the right number of homes in the right places, supported by the right kinds of connections. So that is, is just worth noting in the background as being an important part of the debate that carries on, as it were, uh, alongside these proposed changes to the local planning system. Uh, what we see uh, set out in the white paper are the existing challenges within the system as identified by the government. Uh, and they refer to the idea that the existing system is too complex. Um, it involves significant amounts of discretion and for discretion, um, perhaps some other con consultation respondees read judgment. Um, it involves a protracted process. So that is undoubtedly true for anyone who has significant experience of local plan examinations uh, with complicated assessments within the context of that exam and therefore that there has been a lot of public trust in the way that local plans are being brought forward and if they're going to be the linchpin for guiding uh, key developments into the future then the uh, benefits of having public trust behind the scheme are clear and so in identifying those challenges which most people with significant experience of local plans would have a degree of sympathy for the government has proposed this uh, very new radical approach, and it's to move fundamentally from a system based on judgments and based on the application of a wide range of planning policies that might apply to any particular case to a much more, on, on the one hand, um, perhaps rigid set of rules that will be applied but which therefore hopefully will provide more certainty to those who are engaged in the process at a much earlier stage, at least in relation to the principles of development and the broad parameters about what a decision maker not might find acceptable, but will be driven uh, to find acceptable because it's already been set out either at a national level within binding, uh, effectively binding guidance or within the local plan, which the white paper uh, hopes as an aspiration will become the definitive tool locally for guiding development. So uh, what those simple messages uh, serve to show is the level of importance that planning decision making will, uh, from the time that these reforms come in, uh, have to attach to the local plan itself. And, and that has its own implications. Um, one of the main issues that is uh, raised in the consultation is the idea of how adequate resourcing is going to be provided so that local authorities and their development partners are able at what is uh, compared to today's approach a relatively early stage of the process 
to really be able to show with a high level of certainty that uh, permission in principle ought to be granted for potentially very significant numbers of, of new homes in certain areas at the time of what would traditionally be the allocation phase of a local plan process. And so there's a, a clear move towards front loading and the resource implications of that and how they're going to be addressed is not dealt with at the moment in, in significant or really any level of detail within the white paper itself. So all of that is to follow. And these are critical things um, to how the system will work and in, indeed work successfully into the future. One of the interesting things to think about, just in terms of the sheer arithmetic in local plans, is the absence of coverage still across the country in terms of up to date, as the government defines them, local plans. And so there is clearly an important gap there that needs to be filled by uh, a, a, a modification, at least, of this system. And then the fact that on the government's analysis, the adoption of new and up-to-date plans is taking uh, over five years, averaging seven years or on occasion. And this is obviously going right from the start of the process through to the end, not simply the examination and adoption phases, but sometimes over 10 years. And there's a very real contrast between that kind of approach and what the government has been seeking since it changed the regulatory framework to do, which is encourage reviews of plans at least every five years uh, and it seems clear that one can't have those two things standing together so if there is going to be a realistic system for the substantial revision of plans at least every five years then some uh, some impressive streamlining is going to be necessary in order to allow that to take place now the way that the government intends to approach this issue is by allowing a zoning system of a kind that's familiar in some other jurisdictions, but where the planning rules uh, do work differently and largely are quite highly codified, even, even more than they are uh, in this country. But the area approach will have three essential designations. Growth, um, which I've put in two different colours, because depending on um, your, your approach and the approach of local politicians, you may uh, regard that as a good thing or a neutral thing, or it may be regarded as something that is really quite difficult politically to achieve in certain areas. Uh, then there is renewal and then the idea of protected zones. So in relation to the growth, it's important to note that what that is intended to facilitate is substantial development, but of a kind that will be specified in the plan and quite how and the level of precision with, within which that specification of land uses is going to operate. It again remains, um, first of all, potentially for the primary legislation, perhaps the secondary legislation, and then further de details coming forward through the guidance. Uh, Renewal areas are interestingly described in the white paper in really quite a, a neutral fashion as being areas where uh, permission in principle still ought to be acceptable in accordance with a strengthened version of the presumption in favour of sustainable development. But the really sole example that's given within the white paper itself is the idea of gentle densification and those who are familiar with the way that the 2019 MPPF is operating in terms of densification in particular in areas where there is otherwise the alternative of greenbelt release uh, might think that gentle densification is quite a long way away from what uh, even at the moment is happening in terms of local plan making in those kinds of areas. The interesting uh, idea about the protected areas at a high level is that development there will be restricted but not precluded and so within those areas there will be a similar application process to the application process that we currently have rather than a more streamlined fast track approach to applications as appears to be envisaged for the growth areas and indeed for the renewal areas and one of the parts of the new proposed system that has really come quite sharply into focus in 
the consultation responses is really whether the idea of having three relatively simply defined kinds of areas provides the level of subtlety uh, that the planning system currently enjoys, one might say, uh, and that allows for recognition of a large number of planning constraints and how uh, what can sometimes be quite a complicated overall puzzle fits together. And so there have been some fairly uh, clear representations, from example, the Mayor of London about whether or not this uh, broad new approach is in any way helpful or certainly whether or not it's helpful to certain main cities and there may be a case for having slightly different approaches um, even at this high level of principle between what happens within uh, larger urban areas and what might happen over uh, other broader areas of the country. On by way of contrast, there are other representative bodies that are warmly welcoming to use their own words of these new and proposals. So there really is a spectrum of views about the likely acceptability of these kinds of proposals and how they might be made to work. Uh, one of the things that's worth considering is how this zoning approach is going to feed into or be improved by large scale infrastructure projects coming forward. Uh, where one of the consequences of that can be to improve the existing position. Uh, one might, uh, from experience of local plans, think that there is a real importance on government bringing in a new system, recognising that one of the historic difficulties with political acceptance of new proposals that might involve significant level of building is what they bring to that local community that it didn't already have or enjoy. And so to the extent that the government's proposals now are to seek to improve in, in many respects, potentially in all respects, uh, that which has gone before, then if that can be carried through, that may be a powerful tool in making new provision uh, and new housing more locally acceptable. And the obvious example um, that comes up time and again is in relation to the provision of sufficient infrastructure, whether it's in relation to roads, schooling, healthcare, and those main issues that the government has identified within the white paper. So in those respects, there may be a, an opportunity for really very positive positive change through these new proposals. One will have to wait and see as to what the detail brings in that respect and what the proposed changes to the arrangements for Section 106 agreements and the infrastructure levy bring as well. So moving to the first of the three areas, uh, growth. Growth areas will deal with substantial development. Now in what seems perhaps to many lawyers who have read this to be the triumph of uh, hope over experience. And what the government has said is that the phrase substantial development will be defined in the forthcoming guidance to, uh, and I quote on the slide, remove any debate about the meaning of that phrase. Well, uh, the government can certainly have that aspiration, whether or not it translates, we shall wait to see. But substantial development, as I mentioned, will be of a type as specified in the plan. So some of the uh, normal types that you might expect to see specified, I've listed there. And it's embracing the idea that within those areas as well, there will be comprehensive development of the area in a way that is capable of falling within what will be the new one test of sustainable uh, development. And so there will be legislative consequences of meeting the specification that's contained within the local plan in these areas. And the, and the first and key to trying to enhance the levels of certainty behind delivery of what will uh, presumably be relatively large scale proposals is the idea of automatic outline approval for certain matters, well, for, for the principle of development and also within certain parameters so that there is additional guidance there. And that will be twinned with a faster consent route for securing good design and site specific technical issues. So the idea behind the consent route will be that it really is limited to those two issues and things are springing from them so that there is no further need to debate principles or indeed high level uh, parameters relating to the acceptability of a development. And there are three potential routes being considered for technical approval 
are either a reformed reserved uh, masses process, the use of local development orders linked with master planning, which seems to be an important part of the government's current thinking about how these areas will be brought forward. And that has its own consequences in terms of the resourcing and front loading that I was discussing earlier, whether or not the resourcing really will be made available to allow these things to happen within the kinds of timeframes that the government ha has in mind. And the third is using DCOs under the uh, significant infrastructure projects regime for exceptionally large sites. And one of the interesting things about the consultation is that that proposed use of DCOs seems to have uh, won widespread, um, but not universal approval in terms of a potential way forward for dealing with such large sites. Those who have been more reluctant to embrace that potential approach with enthusiasm have done so because of the potential difficulties in there being uh, what seemed to be an adequate political um, level of decision making within those kinds of sites, which uh, are, are, of course, inherently likely to be politically very controversial. But what uh, these proposals do recognise, and, and what it's quite clear that the white paper overall does recognise, is the historic difficulties that have been bedevilling local plans, certainly over the last five years or so. And so here there's a specific recognition of a need to have a change in the process that will help address, for example, the provision of garden communities, which, as I say, have become one central potential solution to the government's need to find more homes. And so just on growth and growth areas, um, some questions. What is the approach going to be, for example, in relation to proposals that come forward that don't meet the plan in terms of the specific proposals that are contained for a certain area within the plan? And the way that the government appears to envisage this working is by a, a application, perhaps part fast track, perhaps part along the normal lines, um, but that only coming forward exceptionally. So all by itself, there is built in an idea that what the plan says when adopted will really be the definitive statement of what kinds of development should be located in which areas and the type um, and density and so on. And then in order for there to be a departure from that, if the government remains true to this theme, it will need to be an exceptional case in order to justify those kinds of departures from the plan. And one can see why, because if the plan is designed to work uh, as an integrated whole, then of course removal of one uh, important element of growth area may throw the overall spatial strategy into some difficulty. So one can uh, understand very easily why there is an importance attached actually to making sure that the growth areas come forward in this potentially coordinated fashion over the local plan period. Uh, there are questions that uh, arise in relation to resourcing. I've uh, put that up there again because there's a, a question as it seems to me and, and, and other individuals who, who have responded to the consultation which is close to the chicken and egg situation. Uh, how is it that the local authority and promoters of land are going to be sufficiently incentivized to do a, a lot of front loading in relation to their preparatory work so that proposals can come forward within the call for areas, which is the first stage of what the government envisages will happen uh, and thereby be taken forward. There, there must be, as it seems to me, a real question about whether local planning authorities will be naturally quite cautious about allocating growth areas uh, if there is commensurate with that a lack of control um, at the detail stage once those allocations, once those areas have been identified. And so part and parcel of that will be a need to persuade uh, those who are making decisions upon the promotion and adoption of a local plan, that the proposals that are coming forward within the growth areas have a sufficient evidence base in front of them and sufficient certainty attached to them, that they can be developed in a way that uh, can commend itself to local decision makers. 
And there's also an interesting residual question as to what the guiding criteria might be beyond capacity for development, which is obviously a key consideration in how the government is defining the three areas. But what other criteria are going to become central to deciding uh, how various areas are identified? And of course, one can say in, in the broadest possible terms, well, that will be perhaps in accordance with the test of sustainable development. But at the moment, the white paper doesn't offer much by way of guidance beyond that, leaving it to details that will be produced later. One of the interesting features about the white paper and, the cons and perhaps as a consequence, the consultation responses is how it deals with renewal areas. And that will be, as it were, a midway designation applying largely to existing built up areas where a smaller scale of development is recognised as being uh, appropriate. There will there be a general presumption in favour of development. And the terms, again, the white paper says, um, will be set out in legislation. So at the moment, there's no uh, clear answer to what the $64,000 question is in relation to the central test for how proposals will be determined in relation to renewal areas. But the interesting uh, observation from a local planner's perspective that occurs in this part of the white paper is the idea that the presumption that is going to be introduced will be based on a further strengthening of the local plan within that process. So uh, if that is to be translated into primary legislation, then that will presumably you know, involve moving further towards the position where the local plan really is the definitive instrument, the rules-based instrument under which decisions are really taken, um, removing the, those elements of judgment. And so the plan will have to become more than is uh, conveniently uh, used as a label at the moment, the starting point of the determination of planning applications that come forward. And again, the white paper sets out three uh, proposed methods for how uh, consents in renewal areas could be obtained and they are uh, similar to those in relation to growth areas uh, but there's also going to be consideration of whether or not automatic consent should be forthcoming where there are uh, developments which meet a series of parameters along the lines of the prior approval arrangements that we now have in place for much more modest developments. Uh, so some questions uh, again that might arise in relation to renewal and, and slight or gentle densification. I've given one example in the pictures there of gentle densification that may be familiar to a number of you happening over the last uh, 120 years or so. But it's interesting uh, to see what has happened in relation to London across that time. But this uh, element of the consultation really hasn't provoked the same level of response as either growth or protected areas. And that may be uh, because, first of all, it's capable of covering, covering areas which have vastly um, different characteristics as a point the Mayor of London made in his consultation response. And interestingly, it may be here that in fact, the tension, the uh, irreconcilable tension between having a system of judgments and a system based on more rigid rules comes most sharply into focus. So as this moves through the process of these ideas having to be very specifically defined within primary legislation and then in secondary legislation, it'd be very interesting to see how the government refines uh, the, these ideas to try and find its way through what is uh, undoubtedly a in principle difficulty in the way that renewal areas are intended to work. And so key to that, as I've suggested anyway, will be how the general presumption for the areas is framed. And as we know, at the moment, that is yet to be written. So protected areas, um, development coming forward outside, as it were, of the previous two areas. And again, going back to, to the ambition, but also the, the breadth of what's being proposed by the white paper. If we just pause and take a moment to read that quote from the white paper, we can see the breadth of designations that are intended to be covered by this one kind of area. And of course, they range from national designations given the highest levels of priority within current national guidance down to far more local 
um, provision and how those will be then further separated out within um, the <coughs> use of the protected zone is uh, far from clear. So we shall have to see how those zones and areas are developed to deal with what might be, for example, in an in a urban edge setting or something like that, uh, a situation where there is a growth area uh, bounded by a renewal area and then a protected area, all potentially in quite close proximity in development terms. So there will be a, a number of questions that need to be resolved there. How will the protected areas, for example, deal with different issues of weighting in relation to policy? Green belt policy, uh, we have a working assumption is going to continue largely as it is at the moment but in relation to the other kinds of designation how is weight going to be really addressed as an issue within a system that is largely based on rules all of that uh, material is, is yet to be worked through within uh, the exercise of bringing the legislation forward and so just uh, noting the time slightly and moving forward a couple of slides, we come on to the new single uh, local plan test. Uh, this uh, may turn out to be one of two things. It could be perhaps the single most important change made within the new system or depending on how far it ultimately comes uh, either in guidance or in application to resemble the already established tests of soundness, it may uh, result in no substantial change at all. But on the face of the words that the government has in mind for the new single local plan test, there are some interesting observations uh, to be made about it. First of all, the phrase that is used is contribute to achieving sustainable development. So to play a part in the achievement of sustainable development and a local plan that is well drawn will almost naturally have those kinds of consequences, uh, one would hope. And so in terms of where the actual threshold might be for satisfying this test of sustainable development, there is at least a prospect, and this would be consistent with being able to bring local plans forward more quickly on a more streamlined evidence base, which is more proportionate to the issues that are actually uh, under debate. And in a way which potentially commands a, a, a much greater political support, which is one of the inherent difficulties in the local planning process, is one uh, sees through the experience of these things that actually there is almost always with local plan preparation a fair amount of political pain involved at various different parts of the process and it's not unknown because the process even on the government's um, proposed streamlining can still take some time with the modern arrangements that are in place for local government there can often be quite significant changes or influences on the local administration during the passage of a plan so in those circumstances there is a clear case in making these reforms for having a process that can more easily command a broader swathe of political support so that these measures really are driven through at, at the earliest possible time and also are reviewed in accordance with the five-year rule that's going to be carried forward. So an interesting potential development in relation to what the threshold will be for the uh, single local plan test. Sustainable development uh, may well um, continue to mean much of what it means uh, at the moment. We again wait to see through the guidance, but that may be an area where the government can in fact uh, have quite confidently a level of consistency with what has happened in the past and how that will be tested will be critically against the policy, the revised policy that the Secretary of State will issue in due course. So that will tell us about uh, what amounts to sustainable development uh, and what the plan does will tell us whether or not it makes a contribution to the achievement of those goals. So in relation to the single plan test, looking at sustainable development 
as I say, the government indicates that that will be uh, largely retained, but with some important changes around the edges, the sustainability appraisal process, um, perhaps always envisaged to be something that supplemented a, a plan and a planning process, but which on occasions has been uh, used to a much greater extent during the planning process. Uh, that process will be abolished. There will be a new streamlined alternative. And in terms of the ability of a local authority to produce a proportionate evidence base, um, a number of authorities may well welcome that. Indeed, promoters of sites may well welcome that. What that potentially leaves um, open is, is, first of all, quite how streamlined the uh, replacement will be. And secondly, the interesting uh, idea that if a local plan is to demonstrate logically that it is a good set of policy response choices, uh, how that is done if there isn't some kind of mechanism for looking at what the alternatives to the proposal on the table might be. So there is logically still a clear case for there being some consideration potentially at an earlier stage of the local planning process as to what those alternatives, whether they're described as reasonable alternatives or other probable alternatives uh, might be. In terms of uh, other changes that are going to be made that will also be important to how the local plans come forward, the duty to cooperate, as I say, is proposed to be abolished and there will also be a simpli simplified approach to viability. All of these uh, points being discussed here, those with um, local plan experience will know have quite often been the kinds of issues that have really given inspectors pause on the way through the examination process. And so it, it, in the sense of if one were testing the government's proposals by whether or not they have ident identified accurately uh, issues that tend to arise through the local plan examination process, then certainly my view would be that that part of the exercise has been carried out uh, successfully. So bearing in mind the first two, as it were, limbs of the single test, or all of the uh, value, the $64,000 question comes into the third limb. Well, what will um, the policy as revised say? Uh, what is it likely to want to achieve? And at the moment, within the white paper, we only have some indicators. We know in relation to Greenbelt protection, the government's current policy is for that to remain substantially the same. Uh, that is a, a very interesting conclusion, not, not surprising in light of government pronouncements over the last few years, but still a very interesting conclusion, bearing in mind the extent to which planning inspectors have found that it is entirely proper for local planning authorities to have released, in some cases, really quite significant proportions of Greenbelt land in order to find the housing that was necessary to meet the need that was arising in their areas. So th there is a, a, a potential there for the government to look once more at the extent to which some of the Greenbelt guidance might be brought more into tune with the idea of needing to provide larger uh, numbers of housing, in particular in certain areas around uh, the M25. There's a recognition within the white paper that the heritage statutory protection and guidance relating to that is working well. There's going to be provision, as we know from earlier consultation papers, for there to be a fast track in relation to beauty. Um, that, that idea that developments that do very clearly raise um, the uh, overall design of an area in ways that are, still reflect um, existing conditions will be um, promoted. And then provision for growth renewal permission will be potentially conditional upon the ideas of master planning being developed either alongside the local planning process or at least being there and agreed between promoters and the local planning authorities at the time that the detailed proposals come forward. And that will work together with site-specific design codes. Now, there are five proposed stages to the examination. I won't spend uh, much time on this slide because it's dealt with in uh, this level of detail, essentially in, in the white paper and not much more. But those, again, familiar with local plan examinations will see that there is a, a serious attempt here to truncate uh, 
some of the procedure that's involved in a local plan examination and some timescales that are, that are uh, proposed to be put in place with a view to there being a much more streamlined evidence base before examining inspectors when it comes to looking at local plans, perhaps on the basis that a local plan may become something closer to a living document capable of being changed uh, more quickly as review requirements may dictate. So moving on to the second and third shorter parts of the talk. Um, firstly, in relation to the duty to cooperate, uh, in the webinar series that I referred to earlier, we dealt with a number of features of the duty to cooperate. And so for, for anyone who wants a, a refresher or is coming to that issue uh, new, it's uh, worth bearing in mind what the recap contained. And I've set it out there. Um, the issues with the duty to cooperate being a essentially a binary problem through the examination process. You pass or you fail. Uh, we looked at the legislation. Uh, we looked at the limitations of the duty to cooperate in the sense that it only applies to strategic matters. There's a summary of the main cases and the question that comes up from time to time about what has uh, in some context been called the mirror principle if your neighbor fails the duty to cooperate does that necessarily mean that you are likely to fail uh, the answer is no for the reasons that are explored um, within those webinars and then the focus uh, that the duty to cooperate uh, properly places on the outcomes of that process and the ability of those who are uh, promoting local plans to be able to demonstrate clearly to inspectors that there is an adequate audit trail of the various um, duty to cooperate activities that they've been involved in. And all of those things will continue to be important as we move through what on any view might be quite a protracted transitional period between getting from where we are now to the provisions that are being foreshadowed within the white paper. And so what the white paper does in, in that respect um, is quite plainly recognises an issue that has been a vexing one through the examination process and which local planning authorities have not found easy uh, to address. So the abolition of the duty is proposed, but it's unclear at the moment on the government's approach what mechanism might replace it. And so that has been one of the features of the consultation responses and a number of potential mechanisms have been involved, uh, have been suggested. And there is a clear consensus emerging, which will always have been there in the background, one suspects, but is now coming into the foreground, that there is a need and requirement for a further level of strategic planning sitting above the local plans that will come forward uh, under the white paper. How formal that system is may vary from the groups of authorities who, who want to embrace that kind of system. Some may choose to have relatively formal arrangements, others less so. But what does seem very clear is in terms of the provision of infrastructure and all of the areas that traditionally uh, the government sought to use the duty to cooperate to identify and address will remain there to be dealt with, um, but they will need to be addressed through another mechanism. So that will be a very interesting area to see how it develops. And a number of the consultees have made some quite detailed proposals about different arrangements that might be put in place. So for people who are interested in looking at the various strategic options, the consultation responses are, are very interesting um, in that respect. And Coming back to the question that is exercising, uh, uh, doubtless, a, a number of people who have tuned in today, what provision in relation to the duty to cooperate is going to be made in the meantime? There will be transitional provisions dealing with the continuation of the duty in relation to local plan examinations that are coming forward. But again, bearing in mind that the government is looking at uh, changing the legislation in such a, a radical fashion, it's worth asking the question at this stage, well, is there an interim approach that might be employed to overcome what have been seen to be some of the worst difficulties raised by the duty to cooperate, but still allowing the substantive benefits of having that duty in place to be obtained? And so there are various potential ways that this might be addressed. And I've listed some of them on this page, really, as uh, things for people to go away and uh, 
consider that none of them are ne necessarily new. Some of them have been tested through the cases, but it's the idea that an opportunity now arises for these things potentially to be uh, addressed. Um, one, uh, and it, it seems to me at least to be a relatively attractive option, is to shift the focus of the way the duty to cooperate is analysed so that it's no longer inspectors quite often after the event and doing, doing so entirely properly in terms of the statutory scheme that currently operates but superimposing their own judgments in relation to the adequacy of duty to cooperate over those of the local planning authority taken at an earlier point in time and of course the difficulty with that is that more information can become available in the meantime to the inspectors and they can perfectly reasonably form different judgments which the courts have held are planning judgments for them and therefore very difficult to challenge as a matter of law after those judgments have been made um, and they can reasonably disagree with the approach that a local planning authority has taken and the consequence of that is that the entire local plan examination process is at serious risk of failing so that is a potentially huge consequence arising out of what can be a perfectly uh, legitimate reasonable difference of opinion one way to overcome that is for inspectors uh, and the tests that they apply to the duty to cooperate to be modified into something that is akin to a judicial review test or that involves a very significant degree of deference to the judgments that have been made by the local planning authority and in fact uh, it, if you read some of the uh, final reports in relation to local plans that have taken place relatively recently there is some evidence that inspectors are close to adopting that approach in certain circumstances but again there's in one sense quite an unhelpful breadth of approach to this and one of the things that it might benefit from is some more defini definitive guidance as to quite how inspectors uh, should uh, address duty to cooperate issues and there's also a case for having inspectors potentially involved certainly the local authority requests it uh, and not um, simply by way of advisory visit but by something that, that is far more binding to the local plan examination going forward uh, the uh, early visits of inspectors to assess how duty to cooperate has been progressing and whether or not it's been complied with and in principle there's no reason why that shouldn't occur at the regulation 18 stage for example and then be driven forwards into the regulation 19 stage so there are various ways of ameliorating uh, some of what from certainly authorities views and, and from the promoter the views of promoters of land have become the worst difficulties created by the current approach the duty to cooperate and then uh, thirdly sustainability appraisals again um, the, the note that rob williams has provided produces a a very what, what i hope is a very helpful summary of the main principles of the law that apply in this area and looks at whether or not much as i have with the duty to cooperate whether or not now is essentially a very good time to use the opportunity to take stock as to what the role of sa should be going forward um, and one of the issues that's identified within the paper is the idea again of the absence of a clear level of guidance about quite what a sustainability appraisal is required to address not what might uh, if the local authority wants to be regarded as useful additions to a sustainability appraisal but what is the absolute baseline um, which uh, any examining inspector will expect to see is it the consideration of different spatial distributions does it go further than that should there be uh, as a matter of routine a consideration of various key policies of the plan and what the implications may be for the plan if those policies are turned on or off or modified in a very substantial way um, should that be the test for all of the policies in the plan and because of the absence of clear guidance on that view and the fact that again inspectors on this issue, issue really do take some some quite radically different approaches to the weight and importance that they attach to sustainability appraisal within the examination process there is as it seems to us a clear need and opportunity now for there to be a much clearer guidance about that which again will continue to govern the position at least for the foreseeable future in terms of local plans coming forward and 
one of the things the government is very clear about is that it doesn't want these changes to lead to stagnation or local authorities downing tools, not carrying on with their local planning process. One of the ways that local authorities might be uh, motivated if, if they're making marginal judgments about things to carry on is to uh, be satisfied that there is a greater level of certainty to how the duty to cooperate might be satisfied and so that resource is not being wasted in that respect. How sustainability appraisal might clearly be satisfied so that resource is not being uh, wasted in that respect. So these are positive improvements that could be made even in the shorter term and perhaps carried through into the longer term where the government is plainly looking at fairly wholesale reform of these issues in, in any event. And so in terms of um, some key messages for the future in relation to SA, um, first of all, the, the idea that is sometimes lost through the process that SA should be genuinely complementary to the local plan process, not dictating what the plan contains, but being a, a sensible way of checking the sustainability credentials of a local plan, which ultimately is meant to be informed by consultation and at one level is meant to be capable of being involved by political judgment as well, because there is a, a very real tension that's not always acknowledged between the need for local plans to command the support of the local population and therefore local politicians who represent the local population and how that squares with a more objective um, approach to the test of soundness and it may be that that is an important area that the new single test when it talks about contributing to sustainable development comes to that it's able to reconcile those two sometimes competing objectives and certainly the government uh, seems very clear to re-emphasize the importance it places on public participation and public participation is nothing without public influence so if the idea is that the, the, the public ought to be incentivized to take part then what they say of course needs to be carried through into the plan making process in a, a convincing fashion so there we are at the end of what sometimes feels like a canter, sometimes feels like a gallop, covering some of the issues uh, relating to uh, local plans today and looking ahead at what is beyond doubt going to be an extremely interesting uh, future over the next 12 months. Um, myself, Rob and other members of the team uh, we'll be updating the webinar library as we go, as these things continue to develop. And so uh, what we will say is not just within the context of the planning week, which obviously continues into this afternoon, but also uh, in doubtless probably the quite near future when some of the consultation responses are fully synthesised by government and we move into the next phase of the white paper coming forward, um, we will be back with a fresh set of webinars to uh, deal with some of those issues. Now I have been provided with a short number of questions. I can see that we've just got to our hour, but on the assumption that uh, there are still in fact, there are still a very significant number of people here. I will just take a moment to have a read through and see if there are any that really lend themselves to webinar answer or whether there are others where it, it would be uh, better to follow up with email. So if, uh, just talk amongst yourselves for a moment. One of the things that I've been asked to do as a point of information is, is provide a, a link for the white paper consultation uh, responses. Uh, there may be a central government page that lists them. The way that I actually obtained the uh, what, what seemed to me to be some of the key responses that I've looked at is by uh, looking at a number of, of websites from representative organisations that I, I was aware have made. Um, consultation responses and so that's how I um, approached it but I will have a look um, to see if there is such a web page and if there is I'll, I'll answer 
um, that question. One of the questions that's been asked relates to, given the need for the various legislative steps that I outlined at the start of this process, uh, whether the government's ambition to have uh, new local plans under this scheme in place in the next few years is one that, that is likely um, to be achieved. My own take on that is that with the various uh, very large issues that the government is currently being required to address, I, I think this programme is uh, hugely ambitious. That's not to say it can't be achieved, um, but I suspect that by the time the primary and secondary legislation is in effect and plans start to move forward through this new system rather than through the transitional provisions that will continue to guide the process for the foreseeable future, that we'll, we will be um, a few years down the line. And so um, to those who are at the moment, as it were, weighing up whether to continue with the existing planning process, um, where they potentially have a gap in their local plans. I, my, I think my uh, first advice would be that, that the government guidance ought to be followed. There is a very real benefit in carrying on uh, with the local planning process. The, the level of consultation response that deals not just with the detail of what is contained in the white paper insofar as the detail is there, but also is, is um, quite fundamental in terms of the points it takes about the principles is such that it would not be surprising if the government has to uh, pause and at least work out how it's going to synthesise some of those criticisms with the system that it uh, presently has in mind. Um, uh, another contributor has asked whether these proposals stop further nibbling at the green belt um, and, and nibbling um, to some authorities might be thought to be quite a neutral way at the moment of describing what, what's been happening um, to their authorities over the last few years. But on that uh, basis, as it seems to me, there is nothing to indicate that the government is going to strengthen further in relation to green belts, the national approach. The current guidance appears to be that it's going to be maintained much as it is. And there are certain, in, in terms of reconciling how, how current government guidance works, there are certain uh, geographical limitations on a number of authorities where housing need is very high, where if they are precluded from the possibility of considering greenbelt release, that will have potentially quite profound implications for their overall spatial strategies, which would need to be substantially reviewed, as it seems to me, uh, certainly from some examples I, I know about. And so on that basis, I would not expect to see a very significant Significant change to the government's uh, current approach to Greenbelt. Thank you to the others who have also sent in further questions, uh, which I will get back to by way of email, but we are running uh, ever so slightly over. So thank you to everyone that's attended. I hope you've found it helpful. I hope you have time to tune in for this afternoon's session as well, which will undoubtedly be an interesting one about how everyone is adapting to, uh, as I have been and others have been, the new remote and virtual world in which we're operating. And I wish you all a happy weekend. Take care.